When Mary of Bethany got to Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, If you had been here, Lazarus would never have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the other mourners as well, he was troubled in spirit, moved by the deepest emotions. Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, they said. Jesus wept. The people in the crowd began to remark, see how much he loved him? Others said, he made the blind person see. Why couldn't he have done something to prevent Lazarus' death? Jesus was again deeply moved. They approached the tomb, which was a cave with a stone in front of it. Take away the stone, Jesus directed. Martha, Rabbi, It's been four days now. By this time, there will be a stench. Jesus replied, didn't I assure you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Abba, thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd, that they might believe that you sent me. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, still bound hand and foot with linen strips, his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus told the crowd, untie him and let him go free. The Gospel of Christ. <clears throat> These have been busy days around here. My head is spinning from all the stuff that we've been doing. From conversations about life's big questions at our pub nights, to explorations of the intersection of science and faith for our morning brew conversations, to exploring new images about the nature of the divine in our adult education classes. I've spent most of this week steeped in progressive Christian theology. And I will confess that when I discovered that the story about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is the assigned gospel text for the All Saints Sunday readings, I began to fixate upon an image of Jesus that is portrayed in the shortest sentence in the New Testament. Jesus wept. And I felt like weeping myself. I mean, what is a progressive preacher supposed to do with a story about raising the dead back to life on a day like All Saints Sunday? The temptation to avoid this text altogether was almost irresistible. But if a progressive approach to scripture is a way forward for Christianity, then we progressives are going to have to deal with challenging stories about Jesus. Wrapping our 21st century minds around first century stories that cast Jesus as a miracle worker is not going to be easy. Now the church is on life support and simply doesn't have time for the old tired arguments about whether or not Jesus was some sort of supernatural entity who can literally raise people from the dead. Not even the best medical science can raise someone who's been rotting in their tomb for three days. Humans haven't figured out how to do that yet, so I'm pretty sure that this story has to be about more than raising a rotting corpse, because if Jesus isn't fully human, then Jesus doesn't really have anything to say to us. We are not supernatural beings. We are human beings. So I'm not much interested in learning how to live the way a supernatural being might live. I'm interested in learning how to love the way that Jesus, the human one, lived. So for days, I've been searching this text, trying to find something to show me what it is that the anonymous gospel storyteller that we call John might be able to tell us about who and what Jesus was, is, and can be. 
but I just couldn't seem to see the point of this story. I've never really seen the value of this story for those of us who live in the 21st century. Even when it was the 20th century, I didn't see the point or value of this story for modern Christians. So I gave up and I decided <laughs> my time would be better spent sorting out my office. We've been so busy around here that there were papers strewn all over the place. I began by trying to organize my notes from the week's events. I figured I might as well just get things organized so that I can start where I left off at each event next week. It felt good to be making some progress. I had the pub night conversation summarized and was working my way through morning brew when it hit me. It was right there in the audio recording that I was summarizing. I heard myself trying to describe an image of God from the 13th century mystic, Meister Eckhart. Eckhart talked about imagining the mystery of the divine as if the divine were boiling. Think of a, a vast cosmic ooze that is boiling away and up bubbles a creator. And no sooner does the creator bubble appear before your eyes and another bubble bubbles up in this boiling cosmic ooze, bubble of the spirit, and suddenly another bubble, the Christ. But for Eckhart, the creator, the Christ, and the spirit are not all there is to this cosmic bubbling. What we see and experience or try to imagine, they're just bubbles. The reality that we often fail to imagine is that there is so much more swirling around beneath the bubbling surface of this vast cosmic ooze. And suddenly, <laughs> I felt a bit like Jed Clampett, are we all old enough to remember <laughs> Jed Clampett of the Beverly Hillbillies? When up from the ground come a bubbling crude, oil that is, <clears throat> black gold, Texas tea. I felt like I had hit pay dirt. All these years of trying to figure out what really happened 2,000 years ago, and I'd missed what was right there in front of me. Lazarus, come out. Jesus wept. How could I have missed what's right there in front of our eyes? It's Hebrew 101. How many times and how many professors tried to drum this into me? When you read ancient literature, always remember everything is in the name. Start with the name, and meaning will begin to appear. I could almost hear Marcus Borg insisting that the two important questions one must ask when trying to get to the heart of any Bible story is, why do you suppose they told this story? And then, why do you suppose they told this story this particular way? All these years of struggling to understand this gospel story and getting hopelessly caught up in trying to explain how it is that Jesus might have been able to raise a dead man from his grave, searching for some reasonable, rational explanation. Perhaps Lazarus wasn't really dead. I mean, 2,000 years ago, if he'd slipped into some sort of state where his heart rate and breathing slowed down to such an extent that people thought he was dead? Well, they might have buried him, put him in his tomb before he had a chance to recover. The ancient world is full of stories of people being mistaken for dead. There must be a perfectly good scientific explanation for this story. Can't find a reasonable explanation? How about we just settle for the reality that we will never know exactly what happened and we will simply have to accept that Jesus was so remarkable 
a human being, that over the years the stories that his followers told were bound to have been exaggerated. I mean, I know how to tell a good story. I know that the secret of a really good story is a kernel of spectacular truth that you weave marvelous details around in order to get an even more spectacular truth. Remember those bubbles bubbling away, bubble, bubble, bubble. The bubbles are not the point. What's happening beneath the bubbles, beyond the bubbles, that's the point. As Lazarus bubbled to the surface, I finally began to realize that Lazarus is not the point of this story. Then Jesus bubbled to the surface, and I began to wonder, maybe Jesus isn't the point of this story either. And then it was as if the Jesus bubble burst right before my eyes, and up through the cosmic ooze came that bubbling crude. Suddenly, I could see the power, the amazing power of resurrection, but not Lazarus' resurrection, not Jesus' resurrection, not even our resurrection, but resurrection nonetheless. It's all in the name, Lazarus. I raced to my Hebrew dictionary. Lazarus is not in my Hebrew dictionary. must be a Greek name. So I flipped through the pages of my Greek lexicon until there it was, Lazarus. Lazarus is the Greek for the Hebrew, Eleazar. Eleazar, if we break it down, El. El means God. Eazar, from the verb to help. Eleazar means, God is my help. <coughs> okay, maybe God helped Lazarus, but how does that help me? And then it hit me. Eleazar. In the Hebrew scriptures, Eleazar is the son and the successor to Aaron. Aaron, the brother of Moses. All these years of reading and studying these stories, how could I have missed it? Aaron is the first high priest of the people of Israel, and Eleazar is Aaron's successor. Eleazar, the high priest. Eleazar, the supreme representative of the priesthood, who held the office longer than any Jew before or since Jesus. I might have missed it. But there's no way that the people at the turn of the first century would have missed it. Why would the anonymous gospel storyteller that we call John tell this story? And why would he tell this story in this particular way? Was he trying to tell his listeners something about the priesthood? New Testament scholar John Dominic Crossan reminds us that the stories in the gospels mimic the teaching style of Jesus. Jesus taught through parables. Parables are stories designed to enlighten listeners to the truth. Don reminds us that you don't ask the same questions of parables that you ask of history. Nobody ever worries about whether or not the story of the Good Samaritan actually happened because it makes absolutely no difference whether or not it actually happened because the story tells us something that is true about life. The writers of the New Testament, says Don Crossan, imitated Jesus' teaching style and taught their listeners the truth about Jesus using parables <coughs> about Jesus. Parables like the two different birth stories in Luke and Mark. These stories are not history. They are parables designed to teach the listeners that Jesus was very special, more special even than Caesar, who had his own birth legend, a legend in which a star appears in the sky. The writers of the gospel communicated the truth about Jesus through story, because history hadn't been developed yet. 
The concept of history would take several hundred more years to develop. Ask a first century person about history and they wouldn't know what you were talking about. So if we look at the story of the raising of Lazarus, not as history, but as parable, what truth about Jesus can we learn? Well, for starters, we can stop worrying whether or not this actually happened. The truth in this story doesn't rely on our ability to believe the unbelievable. Lazarus, the very name itself, is the biggest clue. The priesthood, the religious authorities of the day, were as good as dead. Religion lay rotting in the grave. The religion of Jesus' people had been killed by the long years of occupation by foreign gods, and there was nothing left to pray over but a rotting corpse, a corpse was, which Jesus called back to life. Jesus said to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away, and Jesus looked upward and said, Abba, I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When Jesus had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go free. Years of occupation from foreigners and their gods had left the priesthood bound and gagged and defenselessly hovering in caves of the dead. <clears throat> Jesus wept over the state of Lazarus and called the priesthood out from the dead. The anonymous gospel storyteller that we call John let his story bubble up in ways that would have caught the attention of his late first century audiences. As this story bubbles up in us, can we see our own story in this parable? Can we see that Christianity is bound up, held captive, and lies rotting in a tomb of our own making? Some say Christianity is dead. Others say Christianity is held captive by those to whom the gospel, the, the good news that whatever God is, God is love, is so foreign to them that it's as if they are following some other God. Others say Christianity is on life support and it's time for us to pull out the plug. As for me, well, I believe that only Jesus can bring Christianity back from the dead. I'm not talking about the Jesus who's been dressed up in foreign clothes, not the vengeful, vindictive Jesus or the mealy-mouthed sweetness and light Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus that the gospel storytellers told about in their stories. The Jesus that continues to bubble up from within that story. The bubbles, they run deeper and deeper. I'm talking about the radical Jesus, the scandalous Jesus, the Jesus who wept over the sto sorry state of the religion of his people, the Jesus who could not tolerate a society that kept so many people in poverty, or the religious establishment who cooperated with the powers that be in order to maintain the status quo, the Jesus who reached out to those on the margins of society, and call the rich and the powerful to reach out beyond our comfort zones. The Jesus who abhorred violence and walked in the pathways of peace. The Jesus who was so disgusted with the state of the priesthood that he turned the, temp the tables in the temple. The Jesus who preaches the radical gospel, that God is love, and that loving God is about loving our neighbors and loving our enemies. The Jesus who preaches love, compassion, and grace, and not judgment, tyranny, and hate. This Jesus has the power to call Christianity 
from the depths to which we have sunk. When the Gospel according to John was written, the temple had been destroyed, and many of the Jewish people had escaped Jerusalem, and the followers of Jesus escaped Jerusalem. And just as Jesus reached into the riches of the Jewish traditions, so too did the religious authorities of Judaism in Jaffna reach into the riches of their Jewish traditions. And out of the destruction of the temple, two new religions were born, rabbinic Judaism and Christianity. Out of this experience, we reached into the depths of the best of who we can be, the best in the Jewish tradition and the best that was developing in the Christian tradition. And out of that, new life, was resurrected. For us, the followers of Jesus, Jesus can bring life where there is death. Jesus knew nothing of the church's theologies or doctrines. Jesus knew nothing of the doctrine of the fall or of original sin or the apostles or Nicene or Athanasian creeds or of judgments based on these well-intentioned attempts to sort out who and what Jesus was and is. This Jesus was a good Jew who understood that the creator of all that is and ever shall be it loved creation and all its creatures. And this being, this creator, this source, this Yahweh, this great I am, the one Jesus called his Abba, continues to love creation and all its creatures. And so Jesus understood himself as someone who comes that we might have life and live it abundantly. And so on this All Saints Day, when we celebrate the best in all our religious traditions, when we celebrate the wisdom that comes to us from all the peoples of the world. On this All Saints Day, we should all take a good look in the mirror and see what Jesus would see in us. Each time we look into a mirror, we must remember that in everyone, Jesus saw a beautiful, beloved child of God. Now, more than ever, we need to see ourselves as beautiful, beloved children of God, saints, sacred, holy children of the one who is love. And we must look beyond our mirrors and see everyone as beloved children of the one who is love. We must be able to look into the eyes of those we see as enemy, into the eyes of those we fear, into the eyes of the stranger. And we need to see in those eyes a beautiful, beloved child <clears throat> of the most holy, a saint, sacred, holy, child of the one who is love. My friends, Jesus is weeping. Can we hear Jesus calling out from the dead? Can we be called from the dead? For surely, it's time to let the dead bury the dead. Let the worst of our religions die. Let those things in Christianity that have caused pain and agony to the world die. And let us come out from the tombs that we have made and unbind one another from our respective grave cloths so that we can dance and sing, so that we can dance to the life around us, so that we can rejoice in all our sainthood. It's all in the name, in the name 
name is love. Amen.